Is Apple's new iPad Pro finally the computer replacement we've been waiting for? And will YouTube melt down the internet? I'm Roger Chang. I'm Joni Salzman. And I'm Scott Stein. And this is your Daily Charge. All right, our first topic is one I'm eager to get to, and it's largely because it's not about the coronavirus. Uh, we have Scott on to share his impressions of the new iPad Pro. Scott, are you ready to check your MacBook out? Please say yes. No. Okay. <laughs> I wish. I wish. <laughs> this is right. this was an interesting uh, review process. So obviously, uh, we're working from home. And uh, so I thought about this as we left our offices a couple weeks ago. And, and, you know, some people were like, well, what? You still have a laptop anyhow. But the point is, Everyone's suddenly finding that their equipment is in limited supply. And it, it, mm. it would be really great to just, you know, I keep thinking about the iPad, which a lot of people have iPads lying around. And you think, well, why can't this be a full-fledged computer? And it's it's hampered largely by Apple's software. You know, at this point, 2018, I reviewed the iPad Pro and the hardware was great, but it was really about the software. Like how open was it? How multitasky was it? So trackpad, I I went back and I looked and I wanted a trackpad in 2012. So this has literally been eight years going, um, the longest request ever. And it felt overdue and it's finally here. So like, I, that's my long way of saying the best thing about the new iPad Pro is something that's not part of just the iPad Pro. Uh, the trackpad support is really helpful. It's not perfect, though. So right now, I, I paired a Magic trackpad with it. It should work with Bluetooth mice and other types of trackpads. Like, basically, you could try plugging in something at home to an iPad with a 13.4 update that's out and see where your mileage is, which is really cool, because that's kind of where everyone's at. It allows you to use it more like a computer. Like, I could stand up the iPad and control stuff. Why does that matter? Uh, for editing. So, so for me, it's like, cutting and pasting, getting in that workflow, it's really annoying on an iPad. But and, and just to be clear, you you wrote that review on your iPad, right? I did. Although I didn't, you know, I tried my best to get it all into uh, the system. And it's and at oh. some point I was like, for speed, I got to get back to the laptop. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the editing works. But also, part of it is that Apple's apps and the whole app ecosystem have not been updated for it yet. Apple uh, Apple's core work apps like uh, Pages still need to flip the switch and get, or they may have just gotten the updates, I have to check, but they should be happening really soon to make that um, selecting of text work better. I found that it was really wonky and didn't work like a like a laptop all the time. Things like Google Docs you'll have to wait for. The rest of the OS, there's like two and three finger touch and other stuff. You're probably already discovering this. Like, So it's a lot better than the iOS 13 uh, it's a thing that with the, the hidden mouse support before, which was not great. That is my main thought on the iPad Pro. The rest of it is a really minor update. And it reminded me so much of the 2018 Pro that if you had a 2018 Pro, you're really fine. The speed gains were so minimal or were non-existent in, in Geekbench 5. Apple says it's more about graphics gains and thermal envelopes. So it's like running at maximum. Ther thermal envelopes. Yeah. That is, the thermal that is some really... <laughs> Yeah, you know what it really means. It means if you're using the that iPad for like, yeah, for like super power stuff and running it all the time, the new one may run uh, better. But you know, that's a specific use case. the The whole now the AR thing because I I'm Mr. AR. Yeah, let let's yeah. talk about the camera because that is the other big kind of I mean superficial, not superficial, yeah. but the material change. The iPad, it's got the kind of square bump thing that. The uh, iPhone 11 has, right? Yes, but it's also different. So it looks like the iPhone 11 bump, but it's pretty significantly different. Uh, it has two cameras like the iPhone 11, not the Pro. It's wide angle and ultra wide, 12 megapixel and 10 megapixel. So the camera quality is not quite as good, but it's mm. close. So to talk about AR finally, because people might be saying, Scott, you cover AR. What's your thought? Is a LiDAR sensor. This is interesting because it's a five meter. And just sorry, just to be, let's yeah. break it down. What is a lidar sensor for readers who don't know? Sure. So, me. so what this basically does is it is it sends out pings to sense uh, and map the depth of a space and read the three D environment at up to five meters. So this tech, if you've been following this type of stuff, has been around. Google Tango, their phones could could scan the environment. Heck, go all the way back to the Connect. Uh, the Connect, Microsoft Connect, oh, yeah. could scan. That tech got shrunken down into the HoloLens, into Apple's Face ID camera. LiDAR is different than that. It's in cars, but it's kind of a similar idea in that it's pinging 
longer range to get a more accurate. So, so like, what's the point? Well, like any AR headset is going to do that 3D mesh mapping of the environment to know where things are and place things. So not just like floors and walls, but like furniture, your cat, people walking by. Like if it has a live update, it could like continue to update and do that, but it's power hungry. So that is a very big step for Apple in their AR pursuits. And that's the tech I would expect to see in the iPhone and eventually in glasses and other things. Like they're, 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 for them, it's interesting. For us, you know, it's all about how good the apps are. And right now there are no apps to test with it. So I had, I had almost no real formative opinion on this because it's all potential and claims. Apple's core apps do a little bit like the, you can pop up a, in what's called AR quick view. You could play around and put a little item down and notice that now it will jump on a pile of books I put in the video or like on a chair, which it couldn't do before. And so it's basically like more base storage, 128 versus 64, but it's kind of the same proposition. And I didn't get to use the most interesting thing, which is that magic keyboard, that new keyboard case. Oh yeah, yeah. Coming out in May, but it's like $300, $350. It's like all of this. Whoa. Yeah, it's... it's Really? Yeah. It's, 350 bucks? Yeah, it's the cost of a, of a basic... Isn't that, you know, like an iPad mini? Isn't that like how much an iPad mini costs? It's the cost of like a basic iPad or cost of a Chromebook, cost of a Switch, yeah. you know. Um, wow. Yeah, wow. Apple. Yeah. And so like right now with it, with this economy and everyone, if you got if you got the money, you, hey, congratulations. But um for a lot of other people, that's not a, a consideration. So I'm curious, but it's that's a it, it's already a luxury thing and it's a luxury on top of a luxury. I would just say my advice for folks um considering that keyboard, save your money for toilet paper. It's going to be way more expensive <laughs> in, a, in a little while. Save it for the TP. I have one. We have one question. Actually, two questions. The same question from two different people. Chad and Happy Strong Healthy from YouTube both ask if there are any significant differences in camera quality between the front or back camera and the iPad. And just um, take elevating to the bit beyond that. Is there a difference between for the front camera in particular uh, this year's model versus the 2018 model? I'm sorry. You, you know. I, I feel lame. I should know this already because it wasn't something I was looking that closely at. Camera quality looked pretty much similar for the front camera, and I think it is similar. Okay. Um, feel free to yell at me later if you're like, Scott, you should have known those uh, specs. Come on. But it's also like <laughs> the point being that the camera quality in the iPads is already better than the camera quality on most MacBooks. Um, mm. And so like the front facing camera quality is already like a nicer choice. And um, so I, I think that's the same. The rear camera obviously now is dual camera. It's pretty similar. What I shot in the video, by the way, some people were curious. Uh, I did this from home. All the footage was in iPhone 11 Pro, except the selfie shots, which were shot on the iPad Pro. So I shot those, if you want to know, not with the front facing, but with the rear. So I aimed it, turned it around, and did that so I could get the wide angle or the wide and frame my shot a little better and have it look better. So that's a story. And I also wanted to test the microphone quality. Microphone quality is significantly better. How many times are you gonna be using the microphone on your iPad to record? Uh, debatable, although, because I just feel like, sure, it'd be nice to record audio for a podcast, but like, if you're doing that, you're going to have a microphone that you are, if you're a podcast. If you're that serious, you have the audio equipment. So that's the answer on that. All right, let's, uh, let's switch gears. Uh, YouTube says it'll be throttling the quality of its video around the world in an effort to minimize the strain on networks here and abroad. Uh, with so many people locked down in their homes, uh, this was a question that was bound to come up. Uh, so Joan, thank you for uh, jumping on to answer this, this burning question. Like, are, are our streaming services gonna destroy the internet? Will, will the internet melt down because of our YouTube and Netflix love? <laughs> Like Scott, I'm going to answer with no. Okay. <laughs> but let's let's explain why it's not it's just not as simple as a simple yes or no question. So these are kind of the chess pieces as they stand right now. Now, obviously, with everyone locked down in your home, as you said, that means there's just a lot more strain 
on certain networks over the course of the day. So instead of people, and this is especially the case with YouTube, you know, YouTube is a streaming service that people use on the go more so than any other streaming video service out there because it's such a kind of mobile intrinsic thing that people watch. We've got short video, it's stuff you watch on your phone a lot more than you would watch on your TV, especially compared to something like Netflix where like the majority of stuff you're watching on your TV. So what that means is with people stuck inside their homes, they're not watching YouTube on their mobile connection as much. They're not watching it on a random Wi-Fi hotspot. They're not watching it at school on that network or at work on that network. So what that means is we're getting chokeholds, bottlenecks on home networks. So with YouTube specifically, the reason they've decided to throttle the image quality to standard definition around the world is it's basically a preventative measure. That way they haven't necessarily... They haven't stated anything about seeing outages and there haven't been reports of outages, but it's preventative measures just to make sure that YouTube, which has been spiking, particularly in usage on home networks, isn't going to be unnecessarily something that creates a chokehold. It minimizes the strain on on those networks that might be under the most demand over the course of a day rather than, you know, when peak demand normally happens at home in the evening. Right, and we talk a little, a lot about networks, kind of holistically, about how it's strained. But I think what this has really brought to the forefront for a lot of folks is that their internet probably isn't fast enough. That like the the service that they have, the tier that they have. Like I've I've discovered like selfishly only like because I've started work from home more that my internet wasn't fast enough to handle like both me, my wife, and then my kids streaming things all at once. So we actually had to call an upgrade. So. It's just an interesting idea because we talk about sort of networks broadly, but I think from a a personal level, there are probably people finding out that like the home internet they have is not necessarily equipped for our like new work from home, stay at home situation. Because the the key here is that it's pattern shift. It's a change in how the universe, well, let's just keep it to earth, how the earth yes. generally uses <laughs> generally uses our internet. You know, everything, there's not really a precedent. There's, of course, precedent for insane peak demands during like a Super Bowl or mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. like that when people are not only streaming it, but they're also on social networks talking about it. Right. Those are times when you expect to have a peak demand. But what we have here is this sort of, you know, people talk about flattening the curve by staying inside. We're also flattening the curve of demand for the internet, except for the fact that it's all really happening on these home networks. It's kind of like if all the other highways are out there, they still exist, but now we just have roadblocks at the on-ramps to all of them except for our home networks. That means that we're all driving. We're not all going to the same place at the same time. There's not rush hour anymore. There's just all that traffic in one lane. Well, not in one lane, but in a big lane highway that maybe supports things like peak demand when there are other exit ramps you can use. But right now we just don't have that. So yeah, it'll be, to get back to your original question, streaming services, it looks like they're being proactive about minimizing the strain they're putting on networks, especially considering that streaming services are by far the most, um, you know, downstream streaming intensive services out there globally. But they're taking these preventative measures and it seems like so far that's uh, preventing there being any sort of like crash and burn scenario for anyone's internet. No, it's, it's, it was, I think it was a logical question people were asking themselves. Like if I'm going to be on Netflix all the time and like on Zoom, what is this going to end? Like, and I think the big, yeah, the, the answer, like you said, it's not simple. Um, you know, Maggie Ridden did a great story on sort of how the kind of broader infrastructure would hold up. And, and mostly they say it will, but a lot of it will come down to the bottleneck in your own home, really, whether or not exactly. you've got the bandwidth there. So, And Maggie made a great point that, you know, when we're talking about your capacity, um, your Internet capacity in your home, it's not just downstream. It's also upstream. Yeah, so, yeah. Upstream, usually in homes, there's not a lot of demand for you to be sending giant packets um, right. back to the internet. You're mostly, most homes are just doing what they normally do, streaming their Netflix, talking on the phone, and that's all downstream capacity. But when you're on a Zoom meeting and you're trying to like change your virtual background to a tropical scenario <laughs> or whatever, just hypothetically. <laughs> Hy- totally, totally hypothetical, for sure. Yeah. Um, because our, our podcast listeners can't tell that's exactly what Roger has done on our Zoom meeting right now. 
Um, you're just putting a lot more strain on an upstream sort of capacity that homes aren't really necessarily built and equipped to because that's not what a service provider, it's not a, de a demand that a service provider normally has to suit. And so you're seeing a lot of these service providers trying to figure out ways to help meet the demand of, of, of their consumers. All right, that's, that's our show today. Thanks, Scott, for joining us. You can read his iPad Pro review on CNET.com. Join us tomorrow. We'll discuss how gig workers are dealing with the coronavirus. Uh, if you have any questions about today's topic or if you want to hit us up with questions for tomorrow, check us out at App The Daily Charge. Or you can leave us a voicemail. Yes, voicemail at 862-250-5713. Uh, and we'll include select messages on our next show. For The Daily Charge, I'm Roger Chang. I'm Joni Salzman. And I'm Scott Stein. Thanks for listening.